us have walked out of church on a Sunday morning and we've said, wow, the worship was really good. I'm not compliment fishing, I promise. Uh, but the reason I'm asking this is because we often associate the word worship with the music portion of a church gathering. That's the connection that we make. We leave church and we go, wow, the worship, that was good this morning. The music was good. And over the years, the Lord has really redefined that word for Victor and I and changed the way that we see it from just being a musical portion of our church gathering to being something that is so much more. So believe it or not, um, Hebrew, which is the original language that the Old Testament was written in, in Hebrew, there are seven different words for worship. It's pretty crazy. Like, we just use one, but in Hebrew, there are actually seven. And so I'm going to kind of breeze through this a little bit to give you a little bit of an overview. So the first one is the lifting of hands, yada. This is where we physically reach out to God. Some of you guys may have done this during our opening song this morning. We lift up our hands and we reach out to God. We're declaring our dependence on him, kind of like a child reaching up to their father, and we're proclaiming our love by reaching out. Next comes bowing or barak or baruch. Uh, this is how we give reverence to God in recognition of his holiness and his sovereignty over all that exists. Uh, if you look back, or even now traditionally, when you see someone who's a king or a royal, people will bow in their presence. It's recognition that they hold authority and sovereignty. Next is shouting, Shabak. Say with me, Shabak. Shabak. You can yell in church, Shabak. <laughs> this means to lift up our voices and to praise God with all of our might. We can actually raise our voice to worship him. The next three fall into our most familiar definition of worship, again, the musical portion of our gathering. So the first is to sing or play instruments, and that is zama. This is when we play music to express joy in God's presence. We may be doing that with our voices, or maybe you play an instrument, and you really enjoy spending time with the Lord and just, just playing for him. Lord, I'm just happy to be in your presence, and here I am just playing my instrument or singing my song. And yes, singing in the shower to the Lord does count. Nice. Next is celebrate, boast, or rave. Not to be confused with the glow parties of the 90s, okay? Not a rave, but to celebrate, boast, or rave, brag about the Lord. It's halal, which is the root word for hallelujah, to express praise for God through physical motion. We actually sang raise a hallelujah as a team last week and encouraged everyone in the church to join us in raising a hallelujah, praising and celebrating God. Next, we have sing, dance, or praise, which is tequila, not to be confused with tequila. Please do not tell your friends that you learned the new Hebrew word tequila this morning from your worship pastor. Um, but it means to use many ways to praise God. We can use all of the above. There, nothing's off limits. We can do all of it. And the next one is tauda. It's the word sacrifice. And that's the word that we're going to focus on today. It's the word that's used uh, for, to describe how the Israelites brought their sacrifices to God uh, to cover their sin before Jesus came. And once Jesus came, that word, tauda, or sacrifice, is actually used in reference to Jesus being a sacrifice for us. So him being on the cross and being sacrificed. And the first time we see the word worship ever in the Bible is this word tauda. In the book of Genesis, which is the very first book of the Bible, this guy named Abraham, you might know him, but he is promised by God to be the father of many nations. He is going to have generations after generations after generations follow him. But the tricky thing is, is that him and his wife can't have any kids. 
So God's given them this great promise that you're going to be a father to so many, and yet they can't have one child. And time passes, and they keep trying to have kids, and they just keep getting older and older until Sarah's in her 90s, and people are like, wow, there's just really, they should just really give up on this. And the Lord, though, does what he does best, and he intervenes, and he gives them what he has promised them because our God always keeps his promise. And he gives them a son that they name Isaac. So in Genesis 22, Isaac is now probably about a teenager, strapping young guy. And God tests Abraham and he says, hey, I want you to take Isaac up a mountain and I want you to sacrifice him as an offering. It's a really heavy thing. And in verse 5 of Genesis 22, we first see the word worship. Verse 5 says, Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship, or tauda, and come again to you. By worship, he means to offer his son as a sacrifice. Now, we're not going to dive deep into this story today, but I won't leave you hanging. I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. God does what he does best. He intervenes just as Abraham is about to sacrifice his son, God stops him. And in verse 12, he says this. God says, do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. What's so interesting and powerful about this story is that this is our very first introduction to this word worship. And it has absolutely nothing to do with singing. It's all about sacrifice. It's all about sacrifice. Worship is sacrifice. Worship is an offering. When Victor and I were only a couple years into our marriage, the Lord was really clear that we were supposed to foster a 15-year-old boy. And he came to us with so much anger and so much trauma and drug addiction. And everyone was like, are you sure you want to do this? And we were like, yes, because we knew that we knew that God had said to do this. And daytimes were hard, but nights were harder because for him, he was so tormented in himself that he would lay in bed and his body would writhe and he couldn't sleep. And I just walked in the room and I was like, Lord, I don't know what to do. But I know that you have the power to intervene in this situation. And I would kneel by his bed and I would force open his hand and I would just begin to rub his hand. And I sat on my knees and I would just begin to worship. I had no music. I had no track. Whatever came into my mind, I would just begin to worship. And I would worship for hours until he would fall asleep. And there were days where he made life very difficult. Like, I can honestly say, like, life was hell in those few months. There was so much anger and oppression. And at night, the last thing that I wanted to do was to sit on the floor and sing at 11 and 12, 1 in the morning to get him to sleep. And I remember being on my knees and just looking up and going, Lord, this is my sacrifice. This is my sacrifice. I'm exhausted. I'm sleep deprived. I'm with this child that hates me. And I'm just going to keep singing to you. This is my sacrifice. I love to worship, and I've had some powerful experiences with God in worship gatherings and leading people in his presence. But nothing has changed the way that I worship greater than those moments I spent on the floor. That has transformed the way that I worship. Worship is sacrifice. Today we're going to focus on another story of worship as sacrifice in the Bible. So if you turn with me to Luke chapter 7... That's in the New Testament now. We're going to read verse 36 through 50. You can read along in your Bible um, or your Bible app if you have it, or you can follow along with me on the screen. We're going to dive into this really cool story. 
says, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. And when a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven, so she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only a little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. We meet two very different individuals in this story. We meet a Pharisee named Simon and a woman whose name is not even mentioned, but she is referred to as an immoral woman. And from their story, we learn three things about worship, three things we can take away from this story. Number one, it begins with an invitation. It begins with an invitation. This Pharisee invites Jesus to his house to have dinner with him. And back then, a Pharisee was just another name for religious leader or teacher. Today, we would call him a pastor. And throughout Jesus' ministry, he has met with both curiosity and with criticism from several different religious leaders. The Pharisees as a group, they were not stoked on Jesus because Jesus had these revolutionary ideas and different ways of looking at things. And they felt that that would just upset all of their order and all of their systems. And a lot of them wanted to get close to him because they wanted to find out what is Jesus really all about. And Pastor Casey talked about one of them last week. He talked about Nicodemus, or Nick at night, as he called him. And he meets Jesus at night because he wants to pick Jesus' brain. He wants to know what he thinks. And I imagine this Pharisee, Simon, he was like, I'll have you to dinner and we'll just see. I think he was 50% curiosity, 50% skepticism. But oftentimes, that's how we invite Jesus into our lives. Yeah. We're like, I'll try this Jesus thing out, and we'll just, just see what this is all about. We'll see what happens. Maybe we go to church because it's the good or the American thing to do. Simon probably thought it would make him look pretty cool to have this new revolutionary guy, Jesus, be at his home for dinner. And he invites him, but he has no intention of worshiping Jesus. Like Simon, we can go to church, and we can leave, and we can never worship. I'm going to say that again. We can, we can all go to church on a Sunday morning, myself and Victor included. And we can go and get in our cars, and we have never worshipped. We're there because we're curious. Or we're there because we want to say we're churchgoers. Or because it's good for our kids, and we want them to be exposed to religion, but we don't show up 
because we simply have to be where he is. And we definitely don't want to get out of our comfort zone and be asked to do something that might draw attention to ourselves. Unlike Simon, the woman invites herself. She's like the first biblical party crasher. She's like, I got to be there. She hears about Jesus and where he's going to be, where he's going. And she's like, you know what? I just have to be where he is. And for her to crash this party, it was no small thing. Because first she was a woman. And back then in that culture, women had little to no value. And in a public setting, it was like an unspoken rule that a woman was supposed to be seen and not heard and definitely not supposed to attract attention to themselves. And this woman isn't just any woman. She is an immoral woman, meaning she has a pretty big reputation for doing sketchy stuff. And she's also probably an outcast from all the other women because they're like, dude, she's sketchy. We don't want to be around that. But risking it all, she just has to be near him. Simon and this woman both had the same opportunity, an invitation to encounter Jesus and to worship him. But they respond to Jesus in very different ways, which brings us to point number two. It requires a response. So we're going to pick up, we're going to reread, uh, we're going to read verse 39. They're going to put it up. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. And it's funny, like, what did we expect his response to be to this whole thing? Right? He wasn't probably thinking, hey, this is going to be a great worship moment. I'm going to take out my phone. I'm going to, I'm going to record it. It's going to be a reel that's going to go viral. He didn't think about that. But the issue wasn't with his response to her. And even though some of us can react like Simon, when, we, when we're worshiping and, and, and maybe we see somebody, maybe they're crying or they're lifting their hands or they're kneeling, we tend to maybe look at them and go, they're probably going through something. They're probably, I don't know what kind of testimony they have, but, they're, but, but I don't know what's happening. But the issue wasn't his response to her, but it was his response to Jesus. We can be in the presence of Jesus and instead of looking at him, we look at others. We can be in the presence of Jesus and not even realize who we are in the presence of. And maybe it has to do with our picture of who we think Jesus is and who he is that affects our response to him. Is he a source? Is he, is he just a genie? Is he, this, is he this force? Is he this means to an end? And maybe that forces us to treat our relationship with Jesus like this toxic relationship where it becomes transactional. Or is he really everything? Do we believe that he is the only one that conquered death? Do we really believe that he holds all things together by the word of his breath? Do we really believe that he is the only name worthy of our worship? And is he our savior? Responding to worship doesn't come out of tradition, but it comes out of affection. And we must move from loving him to being in love with him. There's a difference. And, and I'll show you. You're like, Victor, okay, well, that's weird. What does that mean? Let me show you. I love all of you. I really do. I love Casey. I love Mike. I love Sergio. Danny, the jury's still out. <laughs> but I'm really only in love with one person here, and that's Brianna. And if I'm talking with you, we're having a conversation, and she comes in, oh, I'm paying attention to her. If she is talking to me, I have my eyes on her. I'm interested in what she has to say. 
In fact, she's the only one that's, 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 that, that is, al al is allowed to interrupt my meetings. So if I have a meeting and I get a call from her, I'm picking up. But you, you get the picture. Now, don't get weird on me now, but are you that close with Jesus? Are you in love with him? We don't just fall in love with him at church. We got to fall in love with him at home. We got to fall in love with him at work. We got to fall in love with him with our kids. If I just talked to Brianna once a week, our relationship would totally suck. If I just came to her once a week, hey, babe, this is what's happening, this is what's happening, this is what's happening, this is what's happening, I need you to fix it. Yep, yep, yep. He would 100% suck. Preach. When we're actively in love with him, it shows in everything that we do. We'll sing to him. We'll pray to him. We'll teach about him. We'll preach about him. And we will begin to live our lives for him. So let's read again. Uh, let's take, let's take uh, verse 44. It says, Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. One person responded rightly, and one person didn't care to. Simon was such a rude host because in the culture, in that time, hospitality was highly valued. You see, they wore sandals, right? So their feet were super dirty. So it was customary that when you walked into somebody's house, especially a Pharisee like Simon who probably had, had some clout, he probably had means, he had servants. If somebody would come in, they would you would take off your sandals and somebody would have, they would have a servant come and wash your feet right there and there. Also, it was customary to greet someone with a kiss on the cheek. You know, they still carry that to this day. It's just a, it's just a sign of enjoyance. Hey, you're here. It's friendship. The oil on their head would just mean, hey, you, it's, it's an act of joy. I'm excited that you're here. Another customary thing they would do is they would serve coffee. And the cool thing about that is that the first coffee was bitter to kind of remind of all the bitterness that maybe you had gone through throughout the day with no sugar. And, the, uh, um, and then they would bring in another coffee that was sweet. It's symbolic of the sweet time you were about to share together and that all of the bitterness was taken away. Now, can you imagine if you walked into church and we didn't greet you at all? If we treated you like Simon? Right, there was no welcome team. There was no kids check-in. There was no coffee. There was no donuts. By the way, can we shout out to our hospitality team, yeah. our greeter team, our setup team? He does amazing, Davis. And you were just, uh, and you came in and were like, hey, what's up? Sit down. We're going to have church today. Like, your Yelp review would suck. You would, you would comment on Instagram, I'm never going to this church again. They were the rudest hosts. Simon was a poor host. He didn't show Jesus any of these custom common courtesies. He did not wash his feet. He didn't know he said in oil, nor did he kiss him when he entered his house. But we can relate a lot to him, can't we? Because we can tend to treat Jesus like an afterthought. We don't serve him. We don't give him the proper place in our heart. And you know, even the church as a whole, I'm not saying this church here, the refinery, but I'm just talking about in general. We can gather together and feel good about ourselves. Hey, you know, it's so great. Like I'm excited. But it becomes self-serving, so, so self-serving that we gather together, we can miss the presence of Jesus. We can miss who mm -hmm. is here. And we completely make it about ourselves and go about our day going back. Yeah, that was cool. That felt good. And we completely miss that he has to be the most important part 
of our life. And here's Simon sitting there, self-righteous and all, saying, if this man was really a prophet, if he was really a rabbi, if he was really who he's been saying he is, he wouldn't allow this woman to touch her. See, because if you were touched by somebody that was unclean, that automatically made you unclean. So this was a big deal. So he's sitting here judging. But this woman who washed Jesus' feet, dried them with her hair, kissed his feet continually, anointed his feet with his rare perfume, she didn't care about Simon's thoughts. She didn't care who was watching or not watching. She only cared that Jesus was there and she was going to give him everything that, he, that she had. And the response that Jesus said was right was that one of the immoral woman who understood who he was. But most importantly, I believe it was because she also understood who she was. See, she probably heard about this man that was unlike anybody else that was around at the time, that didn't care to hang out with the people that were considered unclean that they didn't care to be around uh, uh, people that made him, might make him look bad, that he was treating women with value. She, she knew that she needed him. She knew that she was a sinner that needed a savior. Now you might be saying, Victor, hey, this is all well and good. But, you know, my personality isn't all that expressive. You know, I'm kind of a calm guy. You know, I'm chill. Um, but that's where it brings us to point number three with worship. It requires a sacrifice. So let's read verse 40. We're going to have it up on the screen. Jesus says, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him a story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver, to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debt. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Simon had the same invitation and opportunity to respond to Jesus as the immoral woman did as well. But Simon probably cared too much about his reputation. Simon cared probably too much about what they would think if he acted like this woman. Simon was probably thinking, dude, I have, like, I'm not going to be invited into the temple anymore. I'm probably not going to be invited with my friends. But see, the immoral woman, she gave all she had. She didn't care who was there. She just wanted to sacrifice her rare perfume and anoint Jesus with it. And you see, this woman didn't just sacrifice this rare perfume, but she also sacrificed her dignity. Because what kind, you have to be kind of at a low point to not care and barge in and make a total scene. She didn't care. And it moved Jesus' heart. And we talk about the rare perfume, but that wasn't what moved Jesus. It wasn't the rarity of it. It was her actions. We have to stop giving and sacrificing what is easy to give and offer something that cost us. Sometimes that could be that means letting go a little bit when we worship God. That means not caring how we're going to look like. That means this is me and Jesus, and I'm going to respond to him today. Mm -hmm. And Jesus asked Simon, who's more grateful, the one who has been forgiven a little much or the one who has been forgiven little or much? And now, again, you might be asking yourself, hey, Victor, you and Bree have to tell us this because you're the worship pastors, so this is something that you have to say. About, it'll be five years ago, no, six years ago now, or five years ago, five. I'm sorry, five years ago now, 
in a, actually next week. Uh, my brother was murdered. And it rocked me. I felt for a long time like this giant anvil was on my chest and I felt like I had a year-long anxiety panic attack. And I'm a worship leader. I got to sing songs about faith. I got to sing songs about God being the healer. I got to sing songs about all these things that God is and does. But I couldn't. You know, last week we, 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 uh, we sang Raise a Hallelujah. I hated singing that song. And I'm a worship leader. I hated singing that song. And for a span of six years, or sorry, six months to a year, we lived about 10 minutes from our church. And in that drive there, I would say, God, all I can do is show up. I'm emotionally not in. I'm drained. I don't have anything to give. In fact, um, I was in charge of, of, of putting people to lead in the songs, so I would lead less. I would give everybody the songs. I just didn't want to lead. But I was like, Jesus, all I can do is show up. And I kept saying that, I kept saying that, I kept saying that until one moment. In worship, and I wasn't leading, I heard the Lord say, that is all I want. Wow. All I want is for you to show up. You know, Brianna and I's story is such a recipe for chaos, man. You know, we've gone through death, multiple losses within our families, attempted suicides, chronic illness, mental health. We've gone through all these things. And in fact, I was talking to a therapist once and he said, and he said, you know what you guys have gone through? Just one of those things breaks up a marriage. The fact that we, that we fostered a teenager two years into our marriage, and we're trying to figure each other out, like that alone, it has a negative effect on your marriage. And I'm not saying this to shame, or I'm not saying this because, oh, look at us, like, you know, we're different than you know. I'm not saying that. I'm saying this because you see a smiling, you know, we've experienced church hurt too. Like, you see us smiling, you see us kneeling, you see us raising our hands, you see him praising the Lord. And again, it's not because, oh my gosh, hey, look at us. It's because we've known him. Yep. We've known him as our, the Prince of Peace, yep. wow. as our provider, mm. as our comforter, as our strong tower, as our refuge. So for us, there's no other way that we can respond to him because we've seen and we know who he is. Our personalities don't need to be different to respond rightly to Jesus. And the come band on, can come on, on. up. Our personalities don't need to be different to respond rightly to Jesus. I bet if I went around and asked each and every one of you your story, who God has been and who God is would shine right through. And I asked myself, how great would our sacrifice be if we realized who he's really been in our lives? How great would our sacrifice be if we realized and we were like, you know, without him, I am this just wretched person that I need a savior. How great would our sacrifice be if we realize who was actually in front of us when we worshiped. Like, because what moved Jesus wasn't this rare perfume, but it was her heart. It was her actions. And your sacrifice today might be singing out loud. Your sacrifice today might be raising your hands. Your sacrifice today might be kneeling. You might be crying. I don't know. But what I do know is this. I want to be known as a church that responds rightly to Jesus. That when we come and we gather, we know who's there. And we're going to welcome him rightly. Not treat him like Simon and, and be, oh, you know, Jesus, I don't know. 
But when he's there, we put our eyes, our affection, everything that we have. And we do not care who's around us. We do not care who's with us. All that we care about is that the presence of the Almighty God who has saved you, who has saved me, who has carried me through the darkest, deepest moments of my life when I did not know if I could lead again, when I did not know if I could make it through, when I didn't want to serve in church, when I didn't even want to come to the refinery. But when that God is there, I want to respond to him rightly. So let's not let another opportunity pass without responding rightly to Jesus. And that can start today. That starts right where you're at. As we're going to go into this moment of worship, again, I want to encourage you. Just respond to his presence because he's here. And I would, I would be um, fooled not to give this opportunity for you to respond as well. If you don't have a relationship with him and you go, you know what? I need a savior. I may be immoral, but I, I want to encounter that love. I want to encounter that man that said, your sins are forgiven, go ahead. If that's you today, I want to give you that opportunity to respond and accept them into your heart. So with every head bowed and every eyes closed, if that's you today, if you say, I want to have a relationship with Jesus, I want to give him my life, I don't want to live like I used to, would you raise your hand if that's you today? 